All right, today is the 10th of February. Today's our third day in lecture for um, medical gas therapy, okay? Uh, if you want to, you guys, you don't have to put your camera on right now. You can if you want to when you ask a question. Uh, it doesn't matter, um, but you don't have to have your camera on if you don't want to. Um, yesterday, we left off with the high flow systems, talking about um, the criteria, criteria for high flow systems were those that did not qualify for low flow systems. So um, if it were breathing more than 25 times a minute, your uh, tidal volume was not 300 to 700-ish, um, and you're not having a consistent ventilatory pattern, then that, need, that person needs to be on a high flow system. The low flow systems, we said, were people who are breathing regular, right? Oxygen might be a little low, but they're breathing in a normal consistent pattern. So we can use a low flow system. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if you're not down at home, his, can his, you know where his classroom is? Oh, his house, well, like that first little the gen ed classroom, he down in there somewhere, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to have a high flow system, uh, it will guarantee the patient's FIO2, right? That's the, some of the, we learned some of the benefits, some of the um, disadvantages of the low flow systems and the advantages for the low flow systems and then some of the advantages for the high flow. We talked about how to determine the patient's need, right? What is the patient's need? Uh, you know, how much does he actually demand? So if he has to, it, it, it's kind of hard to explain, but just remember the demand is three times a minute ventilation, okay? The demand is a patient three times the patient's minute ventilation, okay? So if he is breathing 20 times a minute and his tidal volume is like 500, then you would find the minute ventilation and then multiply it by three in order to find out what his demand is. What is his demand? What is he saying he has to have? Okay, and on the other side, when we set up our high flow devices, we set up our devices and say, okay, this is the device that we have set up, right? And for instance, a 40% aerosol tray collar running at 20 liters per minute or 10 liters per minute, whatever you have, hold on one second, okay? And then we can use that and say, let's find the total flow of that device, okay? Then once we find the total flow of that device, we can say, now, am I meeting Mr. Smith's uh, demand, okay? Some of the key things to remember, keep that in your mind. As you increase the flow or the volume, the FIO2 goes down, right? As you increase the flow, the FIO2 goes down. And my speaker was off, so somebody said something. You can say it now, I was off, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hurt, all right? But as the, as you increase the flow, right, the entrainment is coming in from outside, you will decrease the amount of FIO2 that is uh, being used, okay? But if I decrease the flow and the flow is barely pulling in, then my FIO2 increases, okay? So we use the, uh, the famous fart in the car analogy, right? And so if the windows are up, it's low flow. The smell is really strong. The FIO2 is really, really strong, right? But if the windows are down, that's more outside air being entrained in, which will bring the concentration of the smell down, okay? So remember that. Uh, we also learned about the hazards of O2 therapy. Make sure you guys go over that. Now, tonight's homework is a couple of pages or a couple of numbers in the workbook. Okay, workbook chapter 42. And there's some pages, uh, numbers, I guess, like 40, 43 through 70 or something like that. It's just some more practice on uh, total flow, demand, excuse me, demand, different things about the gas of oxygen, what it's doing to the body. And it makes you get in the book. So you follow along in your Egan's book to answer those questions. Okay, now, Past that, the next thing is to get into um, 
hyperbaric oxygen. But before I do that, I want to show you a couple of those things because remember we said, when we talk about aerosol, this and aerosol what? That, right? Aerosol this, aerosol that. And we said that the basic reason why we use aerosol is because we're, we're providing water, right? Whenever we're providing humidity, it is now an aerosol device. So our high flow devices start with the Venturi mask, right? Our Venturi mask, uh, let me grab it. All right, so our Venturi mask, one that we talked about. This was one of the first high flow devices we talked about was the actual Venturi mask, right? It has a little medicine cup sleeve that helps protect the entrainment ports. Um, and you control the window, right? See how the window gets smaller and bigger? All right, the higher the FO2, the more closed the window is because you're not pulling in any outside air. And if we want a lower FO2, then we need to open these windows up and pull more outside air in. This is a pre-made Venturi mask. Uh, this is cool. I, I, I really don't like this one because the lines are too close together. I like the one we can just make on our own. So this was the first high flow device was the Venturi mask, which uses the Venturi principle of air entrainment. Air, air entrainment means sucking in outside air. And then we had our own little Venturi that we can make. Remember the different colors? We had pink, which was 40%, and orange, which is 50%, okay, and it's other colors. I want to bring all of them out. So you have your Venturi device, then you have your large bore tubing, right? So we have a large bore tubing, put it on top here, and then we put our small bore tubing on the bottom. All right. One end goes here, and the other end will go on the actual flow meter, right? there on the oxygen. And then of course we would have a simple face mask, which is a look, this is, this is called a aerosol mask, okay? This is an aerosol mask. It looks close to a simple O2 mask, okay? But this is used in a lot of things. We'll use this for breathing treatment. We'll use this for aerosol face mask. We'll use this for Venturi mask. It's just a, one of those average things you use for everything, right? The aerosol mask, it has two large openings on the side. This is called an aerosol mask that we use for the Venturi mask. This is called the aerosol mask that we use for the Venturi mask, okay? All right, so this is a Venturi mask high flow setup, right? High flow system, and this happens to be 40%. All right, now on the box it says, it's 40% if we use eight liters. So you have to use the right flow in order to get the guaranteed FIO2. You can't just put it on anything you want. You gotta put it on what it says, all right? So that's the Venturi mask, either already made or the ones that we can make, all right? Then we talked about the mist tent, the crew bed, the oxy hood, isolate, right? All of those are high flow devices, okay? But then when we got specifically talking about the aerosol setups, okay? And that's what I wanna show you before we go into hyperbaric. The aerosol setups, what you have either aerosol uh, face mask, right? Which will be using what we just had. So remember I said, you start off with what? The machine, all the way from the, from the oxygen to the patient. All right, so you have your aerosol set up. Remember I said you have your large volume nebulizer. This is our large volume nebulizer. 
It's using the Venturi principle of air entrainment. See how the windows open up or close for the difference in FI2, okay? If they're wide open, you're gonna have a low FI2 because you're pulling in a lot of outside air, okay? This one happens to have the, the ranges on the side where you just pick the FI2 you want. Has the water in it. Now, this is the Venturi principle here, okay? The air entrainment is the Venturi principle. Who can tell me what this principle is here? Who can tell me what this principle is of this small straw here? Who can tell me what this principle is? Huh? Bernoulli, Bernoulli, good. The Bernoulli principle. Remember they said that uh, we govern the high flow system, the aerosol systems with the Bernoulli and the Venturi system. The Bernoulli is how gas is forced up through a small radius and it increases the velocity on the side and all that. That's the Bernoulli principle, okay? That's the Bernoulli principle that is teamed up with the Venturi system, which is on the top or on the side, as far as air entrainment. Okay, everybody got that? Venturi system is the air entrainment, and Bernoulli will be that straw inside. Okay, so that's the same as that one. Same thing on this one here. They look this, they look a little different, but they're the same thing, right? If I take the lid off of this, we have the straw. This straw is the Bernoulli principle. And the windows here are for air entrainment. That's the Venturi principle, okay? So when I'm setting up an aerosol this or an aerosol that, I first have to put my large volume nebulizer onto my oxygen flow meter. So I hook this up here. Okay, I can cut on whatever flow meter I flow out that I want on. I'm gonna put it on 10 liters per minute. Oh, let's do 12. All right, so after I do my large volume nebulizer, the next thing is my large bar tubing. We have to have two sets of large bar tubing. This, this is the first one. All right, so I got one large bar tubing, goes on here. I don't know if y'all can see that mist coming out. All right, that's the first large bar tubing. Then after that, I have to put on a water trap or a water bag. It may be a little cup looking device. It may be a bag, okay? But that, because this is water vapor, right? Eventually, as the temperature cools on the outside of this tubing, what's gonna happen to the water on the inside? Condensation. Condensation, or we call it rain out, right? Just like the clouds, as the clouds fill up with water, and the clouds that you see outside are just puffs of water, okay, water vapor. And as the temperature outside of the cloud gets colder, the water gets heavier and heavier. They start to coalesce, right? They start to come together. And as those water droplets, be, as these water droplets get colder, they get closer and closer together. They're not spaced out like a gas, right? They become closer and closer together. And as they start to coalesce, they get bigger and heavier and then gravity makes them fall from the air, right? They lose their stability to be able to float. And so as they get cooler, they start to rain out. Now, if I don't have some way to trap that water, that water eventually will pour into my patient's tray or into his face, right? So we have to have a water trap. Now we usually put this water trap wherever the gravity is in the line, okay? So you see, it'll be like, if I have two, two system, wherever the system's lag or the trough, right? Wherever the trough is, is where I will cut because these tubing here, these large bore tubing have these smooth surfaces. You got a smooth surface here, smooth surface here, smooth surface here. That's where you cut. You don't cut on the ridges, okay? You have to cut in the smooth surface so you can put a breathing treatment in line, put some type of manometer in line, a water trap in line, whatever you want. Home people who are on trade college at home, they have to decide where they're going to put it based on what grandmom's bed is, right? So if I got her tank right here, her bed is way over there, then I don't want to put the water bag right by her. 
I want to put the water bag where the gravity pulls the, the line down, okay? So you just snip it and put your stuff in line, all right? If they're getting breathing treatments, you have to put a breathing treatment in line, you snip it and put it in line. Who remembers how many cc's of dead space are in each section of this large part two? 50. 50 cc's, good. So after that, Large volume nebulizer, got my first large bar tubing, my water bag, now it's time for my second large bar tubing. So I put on my second large bar tubing, and then I go to my patient. Now this is just an aerosol this or aerosol that right now. Doesn't have a name. It only has a name when I put something on the end. So this is an aerosol. If I put an aerosol mask on here, now this becomes a what? I'm trying to. All right, so this is just an aerosol this or aerosol that until I put whatever's going to go on the end. I'm going to put an aerosol mask on the end. So now this is called an aerosol face mask. This is an aerosol face mask, all of this. It is now called an aerosol face mask because I use an aerosol mask for it, okay? If I take the mask off, now it's just called an aerosol this or an aerosol that, okay? The next thing, what if the patient has a trach? Well, if the patient has a trach like this gentleman here, then I use a trach mask. This is a trach mask. So this is an aerosol this or an aerosol that. Now, if I put a trach mask on it, or a trait collar on it. Now, what is this called? Aerosol trait collar. Aerosol trait collar. All right. This is an aerosol trait collar. Good. Simple. All right. The next thing I want to show you today. You got to turn your volume down too, Brittany. is a aerosol T-piece and an aerosol face tint, okay? Aerosol T-piece. Oh. oh yeah, just leave out of it. Aerosol T-piece, you can stay, if you, as long as you stay muted and then turn your computer's volume on mute, like mute your computer, like you don't wanna hear nothing coming from your computer, it won't be a problem. All right, so let me show you those. Just brought them in here. All right. Aerosol face tint. This, guys, is called a face tint, which you would have seen on the charisma. What you laughing at? This is an aerosol face tint, OK? This is what I would use on a patient who has facial problems, like uh, just had facial surgery, uh, burns to the face, or they're like super claustrophobic and they do not want nothing on their face. Well, with a face tint, I can just do it like this. Put this around the patient's neck and it hangs just like this. And the oxygen is going through here, it's just pouring into their face, right? This is called a face tint. It'll just sit just like this on their chest and they can get the oxygen without it touching their face. If they have, just matter, you know, you have people who have third degree yes. burns. I was just gonna say that, yeah, with the fires. Mm -hmm. That's the one I, I don't think. Yeah, if they have third degree burns or uh, have facial trauma, they had a car wreck and their face has been crushed, right? But they still need oxygen and not necessarily if you have a crushed face or chin, I don't want to try to intubate you, right? I can't put the tube down your throat and extend your jaw because you're all broke up. And then if it's real bad, it might be hard for me to put a trach in you too. So if you're, luckily you don't need ventilation and all you need is oxygenation, 
and we can handle that, okay? I can put a little face tint there. It'll blow that FO2 right there in your face, no matter how you're breathing, because this is a whole high flow system, right? Don't forget, you either have two issues, ventilation or what? Oxygenation. Those are two different problems. So if what I have- What do if they needed ventilation? Probably gonna have to trach them. If their face is all crushed up, they will have to have an emergency tracheostomy. Yeah, emergency tracheostomy. Uh, but yeah, so if, if just remember, I don't want you to make that mistake thinking that ventilation and oxygenation is the same. A patient that needs oxygen needs oxygen because they're hypoxic, not because they're not ventilating, all right? If somebody is not ventilating, we have to give them ventilation. And remember, ventilation is when you're moving air in and out the lungs. If I'm just oxygenating you, you're moving your own air. I'm just giving you a little touch of oxygen to go with it, okay? You're moving your own ventilation if you're ventilating. If you're breathing spontaneously like you are all right now, but your oxygen is low, that doesn't mean you're not ventilating. That means you're not oxygenating for whatever reason. Either the, there's a shunt going on in your lungs or you have some kind of disease process, uh, your iron or your hemoglobin is super low, right? There will be reasons why you're not oxygenating. It had nothing to do with forcing air. When you need ventilation, that's your CO2 problem, right? Because CO2 is ventilation. So if your CO2 is the problem, then I need to force some air in you, right? I need to actually put a mask on your face and force positive air into make your lungs do what they do, okay? And that ventilation will control your CO2, okay? So if your CO2 is really high, Michaelin, then I need to give some positive pressure to bring that CO2 down, right? Because I want to increase the either respiratory rate or your volume that you're taking, your tidal volume. If somebody's CO2 is 80 millimeters of mercury and the tidal volume that they have is only 100, then what are you going to do? Increase the oxygen or increase the tidal volume? Increase the tidal volume. Tidal volume, because it's a ventilation problem, right? So let's ask a couple of those questions. You have a patient whose CO2, his CO2 is 150, super acidic, right? Okay. What will you do? Will you increase his oxygen or will you increase his ventilation? His ventilation. His ventilation. Got nothing to do with oxygenation. You can give him 100% all day long, but if he's not ventilating, <laughs> then his CO2 is going to stay messed up, right? So what about this? What if you have a person whose CO2 is 40 and his oxygen or his PaO2 is 15? What are you going to give him? Volume or oxygen? Oxygen. Oxygen. His volume is not a problem. His CO2 is 40. It's perfect. So his ventilation is not the issue. It's his oxygenation. So I can give him a mask or some type of oxygen device and control and fix hypoxemia. Okay? So please do not get that twisted as you move on. Oxygen and, 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 and ventilation are two different things. Okay? Two separate things. Now, so this was a face tint. So this right here, like we said, without nothing on it, is an aerosol this or an aerosol that, right? But once I put this face tint on it, it now becomes a what? Aerosol face tint. Aerosol face tint. Real, real simple. Okay? This is an aerosol face tint now. Okay? All right? Take that off. The next thing would be what we call a T-piece. A T-piece. And this is what I will put on a patient uh, that may have a trach or if they have an ET tube. Somebody who is on a ventilator that has the tube coming out of his mouth, the ET tube. Before I pull that whole tube out of his throat and say, all right, breathe. I want to see if he can live without the life support. And so in that case, I would formulate what's called a aerosol T-piece. It's use of a Briggs adapter, known as a T-piece, okay? I put it on the end of my aerosol, just like this. And then I put another one on the end here, 
and that's a T piece. This is an aerosol T piece. Okay, I can put this on the end of that tube that's coming out of his mouth, just giving him some blow by oxygen. Because before I pull that tube, I need to know if he can sustain life without being given breaths, right? Excuse me. If he's on life support, you don't just take the life support, just pull the tube and then say, okay, breathe. You have to wean them down from the support. When we first put them on there on 100% support, they do, we're doing everything for them. They're not breathing over the vent, nothing. As they get better, they start to breathe more spontaneously. They start to build up their respiratory drive and their strength. And I can say, oh, he's wide awake watching TV and he wants that tube out. But before I take that tube out, let me see if I can give you this T-piece trial, right? It's called a T-piece, spontaneous T-piece trial. We'll put him on here and see if he can breathe. And I just, you know, I do it for about an hour. Mr. Johnson, you breathing all right? Uh-huh, I'm fine. Oxygen is good. Heart rate is good, right? Blood pressure is constant. Everything's cool. Now I can say, all right, let's extubate and pull the tube out, all right? Because if I pull it first and don't know if he can live without it, then if he doesn't fly, we have to put him back to sleep, put him back intubated and put him back on the machine, starting all over again, okay? And so that's why we call it T-piece trials, right? So this is how you would put it on. This is an aerosol T-piece. All it is, is the aerosol this or the aerosol that, right? But you add it on a T-piece. This T-piece is known as the Briggs adapter, which will be on the exam. Make sure you know that the T-piece is a Briggs adapter, okay? Because when I say, make me an aerosol T-piece, you're going to have to be, go through the stuff and pick up the Briggs adapter. You'll need your 50cc tubing, right? And the rest of your aerosol this, aerosol that. You put on your T-piece, boom, and then the other reservoir right here, the little six inch right here, boom, and that's the T-piece. Now, this is how you would put it on a trach patient. Just stick it on there, just like that, okay? This is his trach. I'm just gonna put the T-piece right on the trach, boom. Because if he's trached and on the ventilator, I don't want to, I don't want to pull him off the trach either. I want to make sure he can just, he can survive without the machine. Okay, so I will take him off the machine and put him on a trach, a T piece, to see if he can suffice. Right? We call it sink or swim. We're going to see if he can sink or swim. Okay. If he if he sinks, I can just put the ventilator back on and he's fine. But if he swims, now I can consider pulling the damn trach at some point. Okay, it's not a not a like tonight or tomorrow or nothing like that. But now that's just getting us past that process further into our weaning protocol. Whatever your protocol is at your hospital is what you would do then. You pass the T-piece trial, then you follow the next step, whatever that is in your weaning process. Okay, respiratory have we have our own protocol, so we follow our own beat to our own drum. Okay. Uh, the, the protocol is already signed off on by the physician. And so we just follow the steps as we see fit. Okay. But if you are incompetent and the doctor knows you are, and your team is, then he or she will write every order. Try this trial. If that don't work, call me. If this don't work, do this. And it's like, it, you just following orders instead of having your own therapy that you can do because the doctor trusts you. All right. So you need to make sure you know what you're doing. So this is the aerosol this, aerosol that. We have several things we can add on it for our high flow system. This is the aerosol T piece. What is this? What is this called now? Aerosol, aerosol tray collar. collar. Aerosol tray collar. What is this called? The aerosol. Nice, Matt. Face, face 10. 10. Aerosol face 10. Good. And then what is this called? Aerosol, aerosol face 10. Aerosol. Right. And then, of course, this is called aerosol Venturi mask. Not aerosol. No aerosol to this. Venturi mask. Venturi mask. A Venturi mask. Good. A Venturi mask. Okay. Those are your high flow devices. Those are the ones you're going to have to be able to hook up. 
Those are the ones that you'll see in lab, in your lab um, uh, videos in the module. You should, it should show you uh, some of the different devices and how you hook them up. As long as you watch this video, you shouldn't have any problem, okay? Now, those are the high flow devices and the high flow devices, don't forget, guarantee what? I can guarantee what with a high flow device? FiO2. FiO2 is guaranteed, no matter how you breathe. I don't care if you breathe a thousand times a minute. I can guarantee that every breath you take will be at whatever FiO2 I put in there, okay? In a low flow device, they're comfortable, but you cannot guarantee what with a low flow device? FIO2. I can't guarantee it, but now I can estimate my FIO2, right? So for instance, if somebody is on a nasal cannula at two liters per minute, what can I estimate their FIO2 if they're breathing normal? 28%. 28%. 28%. What about four liters? 36%. 36%. Using the rule of fours. Okay. Excellent. All right. So what we're going to do now, guys, is we're going into hyperbaric chamber. We talked about that with some detail uh, last time when I was talking about barometric pressure and how barometric pressure uh, on a normal sea level, oxygen exerts 159 millimeters of mercury of pressure in the atmosphere at normal sea level, right? One atmosphere. Well, if that's not enough, and for other reasons, we can use what's called hyperbaric therapy, HBO. Okay, not horrible body oil. That's what they used to say in school when I was young. Asked, do we have HBO? Uh, do they even still have HBO in the, on cable now? Okay, but I used to have a, a channel called HBO. And then everybody used it's to ask. It's still there. Oh, okay. They used to ask, you got HBO? And look, what is that, horrible body odor? No. Anyway. That was a joke back in the day. But now, HBO is hyperbaric oxygen, okay? HBOT, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, we can use that for uh, wound care. You're gonna see on this little short video uh, about different things they use hyperbaric chamber for, okay? Uh, we're going to think about it in terms of oxygenation because at two atmospheres or three atmospheres, that triples the pressure of oxygen, right? So now I'm forcing the oxygen into your tissues, right? Because the pressure was 159, but when I drop you down to two or three atmospheres, now I can actually force the oxygen to those dead toes you got down there, all right? Some people have, you know, gangrene or have a diabetic issue where they have about to get their foot cut off or leg amputated because it's ischemic, right? The blood flow and oxygen is not getting to the toes Okay, and so we can put you in hyperbaric therapy and that will force that oxygen down to the lowest parts of your body to help with wound care. It helps with blood transfusions and oxygenation. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video here uh, of the recording and play this video. Okay, that was the, the video I'm recording. Now, that's the video for hyperbaric therapy. That was one reason, which is uh, bone marrow issues, blood and bleeding issues, transfusions. Those are one things, or a couple of things that they use hyperbaric therapy for. Uh, but as respiratory therapists, we use it to super saturate the cells, right? We want the oxygen saturation to be super, right? And so when we are thinking that, we're, we're in the hospital trying to wean patients, right? We give them oxygen, but we want to get them off. We want to get you back home at your baseline, right? We don't want you to have to go home on a machine or go home on oxygen. But you'll see if you don't know your patient and don't know what the what the doctor is trying to do, you might mess up because a lot of physicians will have their patient on two liters of oxygen just for wound care. Lori, what what is that? Is that your laundry? Yeah, can you see me? Yes. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I was just putting my clothes in the dryer. <laughs> I'm my best to talk when all I see is drawers in the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> all right, but it's all good. So we, um, damn, what was that? 
Um, yeah, so we're trying to get patients off the oxygen, right? And so you need to know that because oxygen is such a healing property, that a lot of times physicians will use that on burn patients and wound care patients, even if they don't need oxygen. If their oxygen levels are great, the doctors say, don't take my patient off that oxygen, right? Make sure you keep them on that oxygen because that's what they're using to help heal, okay? And so if we can super saturate that body with oxygen, we can do a whole lot of different things, all right? So let's take a break. And after the break, we're gonna come back to the PowerPoint talking about hyperbaric therapy. There's a few key things I want you to make sure you understand between the different types. We have one type that a lot of people can get in and then another type where only one person gets in. That's the one you saw in the video. It's called a monoplace chamber where just one person can get in. And then we're going to talk about the multi-place as well. So I'm going to pause here, take a break. It is 1.50. Come back at 2 o'clock and we will continue. Okay, guys. So before we go into the uh, hyperbaric, I want to show you this cascade right quick. This was another high flow system. Cascade is basically this right here. This is a cascade humidifier here, sits on top of a heater, okay? Uh, and this heater is considered a humidifier because it's going to heat up the water and make the water evaporate, okay? So you would have the flow coming from here, from whatever device you're using. It will go and collect the warm, moist uh, gas right here and then come up through here and go to the patient, to this patient here. Okay, and so this patient will be getting a nice, warm, humidified amount of gas. Okay, and they saying you can uh, either use a blender uh, for the actual flow. You can get any FiO2 that you really want to, uh, and then you, it says determination of FiO2 with any combined flow system would be this here. So when we say combined, guys, I'm talking about what's called tandem. Okay, tandem. That means you got two bottles going to the same person, all right, or two flows going to the same person, all right, and so when we have that situation, we have to use what's called a gas injector nebulizer, known as a GIN, G-I-N, so I'm going to write this formula down, because you're going to say, well, how do I know how much FIL2 this patient is actually getting, and so this is how we're going to figure this out. Okay, so let me write it down on the board. Setting it up over here out of the way because I got too much going on on this side. I have my two sources here. All right. I'm going to write this down. I want you to write it down because I'm going to have to stop sharing so I can show you the setup. All right, I'm gonna write it down first and then I'm gonna stop share so you can see the board. All right, so to determine the FiO2, FiO2 equals, if I have two separate sources, it will be first FiO2 times the first flow, all right? plus second FiO2 times second flow. Divided by first flow plus second flow. All right. All right, so here it is here on the board. Go ahead and write that down. 
Yeah, FiO2. This is how we find out the FiO2 if I have two uh, bottles going at the same time. Okay. If I have an if, aerosol, if they printed out the page, it's on there. It's on the page. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here's uh here's here because I'm going to uh, move the computer to my tank so we can see me hook it up, and we're going to figure out what the FiO2 is. When I have that situation, guys, I have to use what's called a gin. Now, on this one, I didn't have one with the oxygen in the air, and my blender is old and don't work. But so I got another one over. I'm going to show it to you. The gin nebulizer is called a gas injection nebulizer. All right, it's this green part here. I'm going to show it to you. Let me unscrew it. It's this here. This is a gin, gas injection nebulizer, very high flow. Now, you will see that it, in, it uh, encompasses the Bernoulli principle, right, with the straw. But notice, it doesn't have a Venturi. The jet or the gin nebulizer does not have a Venturi port on it. So therefore, the FiO2 coming through here is going to always be what? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Because this goes to the oxygen, right? We'll hook this up to the oxygen, either the wall or the, the tank or whatever. And the oxygen will screw on to the oxygen. And you see that it has the Bernoulli principle for the water, but it does not have any holes or any Venturi set up. Right? So that's 100%. Well, we might not want the patient to have 100%, right? But this patient may need a lot of flow. So the reason why we use two is because we told you we can have a low FiO2 and get a lot of flow, right? If they just need the flow, we can bump that FiO2 down and that will increase the flow, right? The total flow. But what if they need flow and FiO2? What if he does need that 70% FiO2 and 50 something liters of flow, right? We can't do that with the regular nebulizer, right? We can't do that because the, the higher the FiO2, the lower the flow, right? Or the lower the FiO2, the higher the flow. Can't get both of them with this one, all right? So in that case, when my patient has gotten to the point where he needs high FiO2 and high flow, then that's when we need to use what's called a tandem. And that's going to in use two different flow meters. All right? So that's when we use the gin. This will screw on to the oxygen. And then this one will screw into the airflow meter. Okay? And I can screw that into the airflow meter, crank it up, and screw this one up to the oxygen and crank it up. Now I got two flows coming in at the same, coming to the same patient out this hole. But then I don't know how much it is because I got this flush and I got the other one flush. How much is the FiO2? Well, if I don't have an oxygen analyzer to put the, in the flow to tell me how much it actually is, I have to do this formula. And that'll tell me how much the FiO2 this patient is getting, okay? So I'm gonna hook this up and I'm gonna show you a first FiO2 and the flow for this one and then the FiO2 and the flow from the other. And then we're going to figure out what is the FiO2 coming to your patient. Okay. All right. So this is how it looks. All right. We got our two flows here, oxygen and air. Turn it over to make sure it's both of them. Okay. Let me hook up my air.
Tighten that one up. All right, turn the air on. Just do it like this. All right. Okay, everybody should be able to see that. Can you see that on your screen? You need a loud and direct so it's not too bad. All right, so I'm going to put my computer up on this. Now, can y'all see that? Good, good. If you can't, get some glasses. All right. So the first flow is my source flow, which is going to be my oxygen. Now, I can make a determination. This, this doesn't necessarily have to go on the oxygen side. It can go on the air side. But you'll learn that later. It matters how much FiO2 they need. If I, if I know they need a lot of FiO2, then I'm going to put it on here and bleed in air, right? But if they just need a lot of flow and not necessarily a lot of FiO2, then I can hook this up to the air side and bleed in the oxygen, right? I can hook it up, give them all that air flow, and just crank up the oxygen as needed to get them where they need to be, right? Or if they need a lot of oxygen, I can hook this up flush the oxygen out, and then bleed in the air, right, down to what I want it to be. So, like I said, you'll learn it a little later, but for us, we're going to start on the oxygen. So let me get my water. This is my large volume nebulizer, which in this case is considered to be a gin, a gas injection nebulizer, utilizing the Bernoulli principle. Okay. Tighten that up. All right. And I just simply put this on here, tighten it up. All right. Now, this is my first FO2 and my first flow. Because this is my first system. This would be my second system. Okay. So I'm going to crank this one up to, we're going to say, let's go to, let's go to 15 liters per minute. Okay. I got this one going up to 15 liters per minute. What is the FO2 coming out of here since there's no Venturi? 100%. 100%. hundred so it's 100% coming from this system right here so far. This 100% at 15 liters per minute. So the first FiO2 is 100%, and the first flow is 15 liters. Okay? Now, so let me hook up my tubing. All right, my first tubing, my first large bar tubing. Goes on here. It's my first large bar tubing, right? Let me scoot back a little bit. Then I need my what? What comes after the first large bar tubing? Your water bag? Your water bag. Because I want to collect that water. Let me turn this volume up. Okay. My water bag. So here's my water bag. This is my first tube in here. I'm going to hook up my water bag. Okay. After my water bag, so I can let it fill up a little bit with air, so a reservoir. After my first water bag, now what do I put after here? What do I go here? Second large bore tubing. Second large bore tubing. Good. Second large bore tubing. And then finally, whatever I'm going to call it, it goes here, right? So we're going to do an aerosol. 
face mask. So this is an aerosol face mask. So I'm gonna put this on, the aerosol mask. So now I have my aerosol face mask. Right now, if I don't need the formula to find out the FL2. The FL2 is simply 100%, right? Because there is no Venturi on this. This is straight from the tank. But I don't want 100%, right? I want to bleed it down some, okay? But now I need my other system. And so on this one, notice that this gen nebulizer has a connection here. See that? That will go directly onto the flow meter of the other system. Okay? Now, what is the FL2 of the second system? 21%. 21%. This is air, right? So it's 21%. So now I'm going to turn the flow up. I'm going to turn this flow all the way flush which flush means it's about 40 liters, okay? So the second system is 21% at 40 liters per minute. Now, all of that is coming to this one mask. I need to know how much is the FL2? How much is he actually getting? I can't just guess, I have to know because if he's a COPD patient, I need to be very, very careful, right? So how do I chart how much FL2 is coming out of here? I have to use the formula. All right, so I'm gonna let you look at this for a minute and then we're gonna go to the board and, and work it out. All right, first flow, second flow. This is the first system, second system. On the first system, it is 100% FL2 at 15 liters per minute. The second system is 21% FL2 at 40 liters per minute. And I need to know what is the FL2 coming out of here to the patient, okay? All right, so let's go work it out. All right, so let's work that out. Got something already? Okay, let's see. I don't know why this keeps pinning. Okay, keep pinning with the people. All right. So let's work it out. FL2 Eagle. The first FL2 was what? 100%. Now, I'm not sure if I got to use, I think it's a decimal. Yeah. So 100%, which will be what? What is one, one? One. There you go. One. All right. One times, what's the first flow? 15. 15. 15 liters was the first flow. Right. I had 100% on 15 liters was the oxygen. Okay. All right. Plus second FL2. What was the second FL2? 21. So point 21 times what was the second flow? 40 mm -hmm. liters per minute. Okay. Divided by what's the first flow? One. 15. Flow? 15. There you go. 15 plus what's the second flow? 21. Point 21. 40. Second flow. 40. 40. There you go. All right. So the oxygen or the first one we had 100% FL2, which is one as a decimal, okay, times the first flow. That oxygen was on 15 liters per minute. Plus the second FL2, which was the yellow, which is room air. So that's point 21 times the second flow, which is 40. It was on 40 liters per minute, divided by the first flow plus the second flow. Okay, so let's learn, do what's in parentheses first. One times 15 is 15 plus 0.21 times 40. Let's see. 8.4. 8.4? Okay, 8.4. All right. Divided by 15 plus 40 is what? 55. 
five. So 15, 15 plus 8.4 equals 23.4. 20. So 23.4 divided by what? 55, 55. divided by 55 gives 0. us 0.42. 0.42, which is what? 42%. 42%. FO2 coming out of that right now is 42%. So you see how that room air dropped that 100% down to 42%? Now, we're getting 42% we're getting of oxygen but what is the total flow of that device? Well, now we know the percentage, right? We know the percentage and our, so this is how you do it. Don't, don't, don't think too fast. Magic box is the FO2, right? So we already know our FO2 is 42%, 42%, right? So put a hundred right here and a 20 right here. 100 minus 42 is what? 58. 58 divided by 42 minus 20 is what? 22. 22. So 58 divided by 22 is what? 2.63. This is the 2.6. So 2.6 air to 102. Right? The parts of that 42% is 2.6 to 1. Right? You said 2.6, right? Okay. 2.6 to 1 is the air to oxygen ratio for 42%. All right? So the total parts, 2.6 plus 1, it gives us how many total parts? 3.6. 3.6. All right? What is our total flow? On that, on this one, remember, first flow, second flow, 55. so what is it? 55. So 3.6 times 55 gives us a total flow of what? 198. 198 liters. That's a lot of flow and a nice little amount of oxygen, right? We couldn't have got that with just one system. Couldn't have got that. But because we have two systems, we can have a high flow, right, total flow, and a nice little amount of oxygen, over 40% of oxygen. And the only way, one way to increase this FO2 would be to do what? So just think of it. If I wanted to increase the FO2 of this system that we got going, I would simply turn down the what? The flow. The air. Not the flow, because they both got flow. Which flow would I turn down? Air flow. Air. That second flow. I would because it's on 40. If I bumped it down to like 30 or 25, that would make the FO2 go up. Okay. And we still would have a nice amount of FO2. Okay. So you won't have to do all of this in the hospital. Uh, and I, it's not one of these on the test. Okay, you won't have to tell me what the FO2, what this flow, that flow, and that flow, right? But that's something that you should be able to do and feel good that you can do that, okay? I was going to ask, like, how how are we supposed to do that if we have somebody, like, dying right there? <laughs> we would yeah, have time to... What you do is treat the patient first. You figuring out how much he's on has nothing to do with them dying. If they are dying, they're saturated, you put them on the oxygen. And then you go back and figure out, well, how much is he actually on? You will treat until the sats go up where they need to be. Right, Kelsey? So okay. if you've got a patient there and he's satting 80, 75%, you slap them on oxygen until that sat go up. Then once you finally get to where the sats are good and stable, then you can say, okay, well, let me see exactly how much is he actually on. Because I got him stable first. Treat the patient first. Then you go sit down and figure out where you are. Okay. Never, never sit down and try to figure it out before you go in the room. That no, treat the patient first. If he's satin, de satin, go fix it. Then figure out what you did to fix it. Okay, it's kind of like when you're doing something at home and you're holding it, you're trying to get the, the TV station right for the game, and you're messing with the antenna. You mess with it till the till the station come in, right? Once it come in, then you can look at it and see what I actually did. 
All right. But I want to get that station going first. Okay. I'm not going to charge y'all for these analogies that you've been getting all through here. Uh, Cause I know that they've been on point. Uh, but just remember me when you graduate. <laughs> all right. So that's how I figure out the tandem. That's called a tandem when I have to use two because this patient might need more flow and more FO2. Usually we can do like 50 liters per minute, 60 liters per minute, and that's on 28%, you know what I'm saying? But now with a tandem, I can bump up the FO2 and the total flow because I'm using two separate systems. Now, in a good hospital that's in not in the country somewhere, you wouldn't have to do that. You would have a blender, right? And I showed you the blender. One hooks up to the wall on the air, one hooks up to the oxygen. You just turn the FO2 where you want it to be, okay? Uh, you won't have to do all of that. But some rural hospitals don't have all of that, guys. So you have to be able to do that. If you get hired somewhere and they say, well, we don't have that, right? Well, then you say, okay, let's hook it up like this. Done, okay? Also, we have what's called an analyzer now that looks back like this. It's a little device that you just put it in the flow of the oxygen and it'll be a little um digital reading that says okay we're 30 percent 40 it'll keep going till it meets to whatever it is it will read the oxygen for you all right it will analyze it for you. you won't even have to do this but it won't read the flow only you can tell me how much flow is actually on there okay all right now let's go on to the hyperbaric therapy Yeah, I'm not mad at y'all about y'all's dog's laundry. I'm just kidding. It's all good. I barely could see it anyway. I just knew it was something, though. I was like, what is she doing? All right. <laughs> Hot mic. All right, so let's look at hyperbaric therapy now. Some of the reasons why we do hyperbaric therapy I want to discuss. Uh, the different types of chambers, and then we're going to have to get into the oxygen analyzers, right? Got to do that too. So we got a nice little amount left. All right, let's look at it. Any questions on the tandem or, or the high flow device? Anybody got any questions thus far uh, on, on high flow or low flow, Venturi or Bernoulli, uh, like that before we move on? Okay, uh, let me hook my speakers back up. Is Heather, Heather, you with me today? Yeah, I'm here. Are you good? Yeah, I'm okay. Kristen, okay. you with me? Jasmine? Jessica, y'all good? I'm here. Yes. All right. Let's roll. All right. So that was the, you know, I had never actually worked that out before, but I said I'll do it today. All right. Hyperbaric therapy, the definition, therapeutic use of oxygen at pressure greater than one atmosphere. That's all it is. Baric. Look at the word. Baric. Bariatric. Or not bariatric, but... <laughs> Barometric, right? Barometric pressure. We said barometric pressure is 760 right at one atmosphere. If it's hyperbaric, that means it's more than one atmosphere. Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna break right. it up a little bit. I'm breaking up a little bit. Okay. Uh hyperbaric therapy, what I was talking about. If you look at the word baric, we're talking about barometric pressure, right? Barometric pressure at one atmosphere. Is 760, right? Well, if something is hyperbaric, that means it's more than one atmosphere, right? More than more bar more uh barometric pressure. So that's just that's the word. That's just breaking down that word. Am I breaking up now? Am I coming in clear? You're good. Then, okay. All right. So definition of the hyperbaric therapy is therapeutic use of oxygen at a pressure greater than one atmosphere. Pressures are usually expressed in multiples of atmospheres, uh, absolute 
atmosphere of one. So ATA is absolute uh, or atmospheric pressure absolute, okay, which is extra, just at most. I just say at most, okay, but ATM, ATA, whatever, it's all the same. At one atmosphere, Dalton says that the pressure in the atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury, okay? Knowing that, we know that nitrogen makes up most of that atmosphere, right? Nitrogen makes up 78% of the atmosphere, thus it exerts most of the pressure, which is like 592, I think, 592, 596, something like that. All right, now, so why would we want to use hyperbaric? Well, let's see. The physical, logical, the physiological effects are it decreases the size of trapped gas bubbles, okay, based on Boyle's law, okay? Uh, it can be used to treat decompression sickness, which you get that with diving, also known as the bends. The bends, which is B-E-N-D-S, I think. Uh, when divers go deep, they can't just come. If I dive in the ocean and I'm doing snorkeling or whatever I'm doing, and I see a shark, I'm just going to have to come up slow. Okay? Because if I come straight up really fast, then my bubbles inside of my body will, uh, in my blood will, will get large, okay? And my, it's almost like boiling. It's not hot boiling, but bubbling, fizzing. And that's called the bends. That's called decompression sickness. You can die from that, okay? Because if those bubbles get in your heart or your brain, it can kill you, okay? So we have to come up slow and allow the body to decompress a little bit at a time. So they come up to a certain level for about 10 minutes, then they come up again for about 10 minutes and come up again for about 10 minutes until your body naturally uh, decompresses, all right? But if they do come up too fast, we have a hyperbaric therapy chamber we can put them in that will bring them back down and bring them up slow, okay? So it doesn't kill you instantly, but it will make you sick. All right. So the main reason we use it is for super saturation. Super saturation. Let me get rid of some of this stuff off my screen. It's saying that it's um, too much going on. Close that window. Here, okay. All right. Supersaturation of the PaO2. Supersaturation of plasma occurs due to increased partial pressure of oxygen, which is Henry's law, okay? The P little a O2 levels can reach all the way up to 1500, right? The normal P little a O2 is 80 to 100, right? That is good, that's perfect. If I have a P little a O2 of 100, then I have no, ox no hypoxemia, right? That's normal oxemia. I'm perfect. But if I get into a hyperbaric chamber, I can push my PaO2 all the way up to 1,500, right? And that's considered super saturating my blood with oxygen. It increases the oxygen transport to those areas that are poorly perfused. So like when people have gangrene in their legs or in their feet or hands, that the blood is not perfusing to because of circulatory issues, right? Stagnant hypoxemia, right? Stagnant hypoxia is because of a circulation issue. So those who are suffering from stagnant hypoxia, uh, diabetes, necrosis, wounds on their feet that don't heal. The reason why they don't heal is because the oxygen not getting there, okay? If the oxygen and blood rich oxygen does not make it to the toes, they're gonna turn black and fall off, all right? Uh, see it all the time in the hospital, all right? Uh, so we can super saturate them. Now, PaO2 of 1500 can be great for those patients, but could be devastating to other people, okay? Tell me somebody who this would be devastating to other than a COPD. -er. No, that's who I want. I want. I want them in there. Tell me the type of person who this a PaO two of fifteen hundred would be devastating to, 
other than a COPD, because that's not always the easy choice. Somebody else, who else would suffer if I put them, if I have a PAO2 at 1500? Someone who has a lung obstruction. Uh, okay. But but I'm looking for an, I'm looking for a specific de demographic. Would it be patients that have a CBAE disease? Oh, that's a COPD. I, that's right. But okay. I, you're right. But I'm looking for somebody other than that. An asthmatic. Oh, that's COPD. Still, other, I'm still looking for somebody other than that. From what you've learned. An infant. There you go. An infant. If I have his PAO2 greater than 80, what can happen to him? He can go blind. Go blind. Okay. So there are some people who will have a negative effect to hyperbaric therapy, right? We already know COPDers. We don't want them to not be hypoxic. If you put him in a hyperbaric chamber with oxygen, He's not going to be hypoxic, right? It's going to shoot up, and then you could cause uh, oxygen-induced hypoventilation. So you have to be careful with them, okay? Uh, but, yeah, like you said, somebody with an obstruction, yeah? If somebody has an obstruction and that high FIO2, yes, that could cause absorption atelectasis for that person. But I was looking for that demographic, them babies. If you mess around and take your baby in there with you, guess what? You might cause a problem. Okay, number three, generalized vasoconstriction. This is another thing it does. Not only does it supersaturate the plasma, but it also causes generalized vasoconstriction, which when my vasos constrict, I reduce swelling. Okay, so generalized vasoconstriction is good to reduce edema and tissue swelling in people who have chemical burns, uh, chem, uh, cerebral edema and crush injuries. If you're somebody working on a truck and, and you open up the bed of the truck uh, and, and all the product falls out on somebody and you have a really bad crush injury or you have a car wreck and you're pinned somewhere where you crushed your pelvis, those people tend to swell immediately, okay? Gunshot victims, they get shot in the head. Their eyes swell up real big. Right, their face, everything swells really big. And in order to reduce the swelling, we want something that's going to give us some generalized vasoconstriction. Okay, that's another thing you'll learn when we get to the next level, which is pharmacology. When a patient has an EpiPen, right? Epinephrine gives us vasoconstriction. That's all it does. So when you have, when a baby or somebody's bitten by bees or has some type of anaphylactic shock, what happens? Their throat does what? It closes uh, up. Closes up, swells, right? All that stuff, tongue, all that stuff starts to swell. And the EpiPen will immediately cause vasoconstriction and reduce the swell. Okay? So that's why we have the EpiPen. And that's why we give Epi uh, in certain situations, right? So that'd be in pharmacology when we get to pharmacology. All right? Uh, so People who get burns or if you take a lot of smoke inhalation, your insides can swell, like your, your inner larger airways, your trachea, left and right main stem bronchus it can start to be irritated and swell because of the burn injury, okay? And so we put burn patients in there a whole lot. Those are not the number one person, really, that I've ever seen put in hyperbaric or burn patients, okay? Maintain oxygenation because of the straight up sure high level of P little a, O2. Okay. Uh, basal constriction can, oh, it, it reduced, I mean, it repeated it. Okay. Number four, increased elimination of car carbon monoxide due to high pressures of oxygen. Oh, another important key fact because we know that hemoglobin loves carbon monoxide how many times more than oxygen? 200 times. 200 times. 200 times. And so when we have a person who comes in from a house fire, this is what we put them on. A non-rebreather. And this is that non-rebreather. This is fresh out the pack. And I was showing you yesterday, it's fresh out the pack. And it, it only has one on. It's supposed to have both. But this manufacturer don't even make it anymore with two. 
because of the safety, right? But it's got your one-way flap here. Remember that. And then, of course, on the inside, it has a one-way valve here on the inside. See that? See that flap? That is the difference between a partial rebreather and a non-rebreather. In a non-rebreather, the patient cannot breathe nothing but the source gas. And so I can get him close to 100% as possible. But I can't say for sure he's getting 100% because it depends on his what? Ventilatory pattern. There you go. Because a non-rebreather is considered what type of device? Low flow. Low flow. This is part of the low flow devices, right? Nasal cannula, nasal trachea, uh, 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 you know, transtracheal catheter, the simple O2 mask, partial rebreather, and non rebreather are all low flow devices. Even though it sounds a little loud, it's still considered a low flow device because it only has this small bore tube in it. Okay. And so when I exhale, and when I exhale, my exhale does not go into the bag because there's a flap there. It, forces the air out the side. And when I inhale, these flaps on the side will close and all I can get is what's coming from the bag. So I'm getting 100% of the source gas, okay? Whatever that may be. And so if there's, if there's a reason why I want them to get a particular amount of a certain gas, I wanna use this, okay? So for instance, when they come in from a house fire, we put them on a non-rebreather because the only way to fix carbon monoxide poison is to just bombard the hemoglobin with as much oxygen as I can. Eventually, the hemoglobin will shake off the carbon monoxide and go ahead and pick up oxygen, okay? All right, and so we talked about oxygen's effect on hemoglobin's uh, affinity, right? Uh, which was Haldane, okay, Haldane effect talks about them. You put a lot of oxygen on it, hemoglobin will eventually just go ahead and take it, all right? But if you don't, it's walking around like this. I love carbon monoxide. You put in a house fire, and so you, you have now carbon monoxide poisoning, and I ain't letting go, okay? Unless you put a whole lot of oxygen around me, I will eventually let it go and pick up the oxygen, okay? And so we wouldn't put them on a nasal cannula, right? We put them on something that's going to get that's going to deliver the highest FiO2 fast as I can, and that's a non-rebreather. Okay, but even a non-rebreather is slower than hyperbaric. Okay, because we already said the way to get rid of the carbon monoxide is to bombard it with oxygen. So if the non-rebreather is not enough, because you know a firefighter don't have a hyperbaric chamber just in his pocket. Right? So the first thing he or she is going to do is throw them on a non rebreather. And you're going to see how long it takes hemoglobin to shake off the carbon monoxide and pick up that oxygen here in a minute. Okay? So I'm just trying to show you, coach you into it, right? To remember the reasons why we use these different things and why. So increased elimination of carbon monoxide because of the high pressure of oxygen. It's so much oxygen in there, the hemoglobin has no choice but to pick it up, okay? Now let's see how long it takes. The half-life of carboxyhemoglobin in the hyperbaric chamber at three atmospheres is 23 minutes. So if I put you in a hyperbaric chamber straight from the house fire, in 23 minutes, the hemoglobin would have shaken off the carbon monoxide and picked up the oxygen in just 23 minutes, okay? Carboxyhemoglobin is the amount of uh, carbon monoxide that's on the hemoglobin. That's what carboxyhemoglobin is, okay? Because we can get a special ABG that tells us the exact carboxyhemoglobin. It's called a coox, okay? We can get what's called a coox to find out exactly how much carboxyhemoglobin is actually on the hemoglobin, right? And I told you the amounts, what's normal, how much would I see after smoking, and how much can cause death? Who remembers how much can cause death at what percentages? What percentages of carbon monoxide cause death? Does anybody remember that off the top of your head? No 
Everybody remember? 40 to 60. Remember 40 to 60. Okay. I think 0.5 or something percent is normal. Four to uh, five to 10 percent after smoking. And then 40 to 60 percent will kill you. Okay. So when you come out of a house fire, you up at around 40 to 50 percent carboxyhemoglobin. And if I don't fix you, you're going to die. If we don't get you out of that environment, you're going to die. If you're in your garage talking about your girl left you and you're going to turn the engine on and start breathing, if I don't get you out of there, you're going to die from carbon monoxide poisoning. Okay? That's how punks kill themselves. Right? Let the family member come see you in there like that. That's such a devastating thing for a family member to come out there and see you like that. That, 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 have to, that would have to suck. Okay? Uh, so... If I don't get you out of that environment, you're going to die. So if I put you in a hyperbaric chamber, you're going to be free from that in, in 23 minutes. 23 minutes and it's gone. Let's look at B. The half-life of carboxyhemoglobin in a patient breathing 100% is 80 minutes. So if I don't have a hyperbaric chamber and I pull you out the house fire and give you a non-rebreather, it's going to take 80 minutes before it gets off of your system. So how long is 80 minutes? About an hour and what? 20 minutes. About an hour and 20 minutes, you're sitting there struggling before it actually gets off of your bloodstream, okay? It's going to take 80 minutes for carbon monoxide to leave the system, breathing 100% oxygen. But in a hyperbaric chamber, it's 23 minutes. See how big of a difference that is? Let's look at the last one. What if I'm in the hyperbaric chamber? Oh, they don't show the hyperbaric chamber and on 100%. It'd be even faster, right? But look at this. The half-life of carbon monoxide in a patient breathing room air is how long? Five hours. Five hours. So if I pull you out of the house fire, and I don't give you anything, it's going to take five whole hours before the carboxyhemoglobin is removed from the system. So you can see... But well, would uh, you get with that, though? That's kind of dangerous, ain't it? Do what? What'd you say? What'd you say? I said that's kind of dangerous, though, right? Because you what? should be trying to get them oxygen as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah, but that's like I'm saying, like, what if you were uh, just but a neighbor? Worst case scenario, you have to sit like that. Yeah, if you're a neighbor, like, if they wouldn't do that. I'm just, they're just showing you the half-life. But if you're a neighbor and somebody's house on fire, you pull them out and pull them to safety, then if they don't get any help, it's going to take five hours for that to get out of the system. That's what they're trying to show you. Uh, what if you're in a rural place and, and, you know, you can't even call for help, right? It's just showing you that it's going to stay in the system for five hours. Yes, that would be dangerous depending on how high it is. It could be too high and you die, okay? Because uh, people die from smoke inhalation all the time. That's how they die in a house fire. 90% of the people who die in a house fire die of this, not the burns, okay? Your body will shut down and die before you ever burn, okay? A lot of time, not all the time. Some people get burned, all right? But, but I'm just saying. Uh, I guess that's one of those uh, special things, special qualities that your creator has made in you that if you do succumb in a fire, because nobody wants to get burned alive, right? If you get succumb to a fire, it's a high chance that you'll pass out and go to sleep before you even burn, okay? You look so all burnt. Is it suffocation? Yes, it is going to be suffocation, but like you'll be coughing and coughing, but then you'll just pass out. Okay, you'll just pass out. Now I'm not gonna say it's like a lovely death or nothing like that. I'm just saying I'd rather I'd rather suffocate than burn alive, right? But that's just you know that's just depend on the person. Hopefully that never happens to anybody. But yes, you will be feeling the effects of suffocation, like <coughs> you know coughing, coughing, and eventually you just gonna go. You go quick though. You don't you don't breathe it for hours and then go out. It don't take long. Okay, that's why we have those carbon monoxide detectors in your home. Because as soon as it detects, you need to get out of there to some fresh air because it don't take long. All right, people in the house, they don't suffocate when they're asleep. They're just asleep. And you wake up the next day and they're dead. Okay, died in their sleep. Okay, so those are the different, you need to know those times. If I tell you, uh, 
in a hyperbaric therapy chamber, right? 23 minutes at three atmospheres. Now you need to be down to three atmospheres. You can get it off of you in 23 minutes. If you're just straight up breathing 100% out on the sidewalk, it's gonna take 80 minutes for it to clear. And if you don't have anything at all on the sidewalk, it'll take about five hours. Now it'll be even faster than 23 minutes if I have on a non-rebreather and they have me in a hyperbaric, right? Then it can be like three or four minutes. Because, it, because now that not only am I in hyperbaric, but I'm also getting some extra oxygen. So that's a whole lot of oxygen, okay? Number five, another reason. White blood cells have an increased ability to fight when exposed to hyperbaric oxygen. Mm -hmm. Your white blood cells are your leukocytes, right? Those are your soldiers of the blood and they fight even stronger if they're in hyperbaric chambers. So it's just like putting a body armor on your white blood cells. So people who have uh, leukocytosis or somebody who has some type of, you know, those wounds and those diseases and stuff like that, they put them in there because it helps them fight so much better. The oxygen is more rich. The uh, white blood cells can really fight stronger. Uh, it decreases the swelling, right? Hyperbaric therapy is excellent for those who can tolerate it. For those who can tolerate it. All right, this is just a picture of how to prepare for the chamber treatment. Of course, don't get drunk. Uh, don't have shower and, and brand new perfume on because you're going to be the one in there and it's going to be even stronger smell, right? Uh, follow the instructions for yarning. Have you ever been driving up into the mountains and your ears pop and you need to yarn to clear them out or whatever? Well, that's the same thing that's happening. You're going down atmosphere. So your ears are going to feel heavy and they have instructions. Don't just be start yawning and popping all day long. That can damage your ears. Right, they're, they're having instructions on how often you should do it. All right, so that's all. You have a patient here who this is called a monoplace chamber. You have a respiratory therapist 90% of the time who's controlling the hyperbaric therapy. And uh, let's see if I got a better picture. Yeah, this is a better picture here. Uh, you have a TV where you can watch TV uh, and you're in there by yourself. Now, there's a difference between the monoplace and the multiplace, and that simply is how is it pressurized, all right? But before we talk about that, let's talk about the neovascularization. This is the next reason why we use it. Neo, what's neo mean? New. 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 So new vascularization, which means formation of new capillary beds in poorly perfused tissue, right? So when you have a leg or a foot that has poor perfusion, when you put them in a hyperbaric chamber, not only does it increase the amount of oxygen that's there, but it makes you form new capillaries for the blood to get there. It's like a, like a spider making a new well, right? It's amazing. It's amazing that your body can say, oh, okay, let me make some new capillary beds now so that that blood can have a new path to that big toe that you're getting ready to get cut off. All right, now I can get to that toe and save it properly, possibly, all right? So neovascularization is another reason why we use hyperbaric. Neovascularization is also very helpful in treating radiation necrosis. That's somebody who has cancer and they have to get radiation. That radiation kills the bone. It can kill bone tissue. And so if I'm killing bone tissue, I can put you in hyperbaric to help form new capillary beds around that bone tissue to keep it from dying, okay? Uh, necrotizing fasciitis, gas, gangrene, and also difficult to manage wounds. So neovascularization is good for all of that. Neovascularization is good for treating radiation necrosis of bone tissue, necrotizing fasciitis, he said 10 to the floor. Uh -huh, 90. Mike, mute your mic, somebody. Uh, gas, gangrene, and difficult to manage wounds. You say this, but, uh... All right, let's go on. Now, these are the, the general conditions that benefit, right? Is, we talked about a lot of stuff, but this is it in one, uh, in one list right here. Hyperbaric chamber or hyperbaric oxygen therapy helps with gas, gangrene, and that's like when the, the 
tissue is dead, about to get cut off, right? Uh, radiation necrosis, carbon monoxide poisoning, ischemic tissue transplants. What if I have a, a tissue transplant? What if I got burned on my face and they took a piece of my gluteus maximus muscle or tissue and stuck it on my face to graft it? Well, that skin doesn't just automatically connect with the other skin, right? You have to put them in hyperbaric in order for those new capillary beds to meet up. And when they meet up, then they can exchange gas and blood between each other and accept that graft. The graft has to be accepted. It could not be accepted. And then it's just a square on your face that's going to be dead, rotten tissue that they're going to have to take off because it's not alive anymore. Okay. So they put that tissue on your face, put you in hyperbaric therapy, and that allows the capillaries from that tissue to start reaching out to the capillaries on the face that's already there and they start communicating, which you have internal respiration, right? Which is gas exchange between the tissues and you have life, okay? You have life. Uh, decompression sickness, which is the bends. Refractory anaerobic infections. Oh, uh, anaerobic infections are infections that do what? Infections that live, how do they live? If they're anaerobic, they live what? How? Without air. Without oxygen. Okay. Without, not air, but you're close. Without oxygen. So these are infections that thrive in areas that they have low or no oxygen. Right? So if I put them in hyperbaric, I'm going to kill them. Because now I'm going to hit them with a whole lot of oxygen. Right? So those uh, anaerobic infections that are not, Remember, refractory means don't respond. They've not been responding to therapy, right? Well, or medicines. Well, what we can do is put them in a super saturated state of oxygen, and now they have no choice but to die because they can't live in oxygen-rich environment. An anaerobic infection cannot live in an oxygen-rich environment. They have to live in a non-oxygen environment, understand? And so we treat that type of infection with hyperbaric oxygen. Crush injury. Crush injuries are also treated because they treat, uh, crush injury was uh, because they uh, cause swelling, right? Oh no. All right, and then enhance healing of problematic wounds. You just got them wounds that just won't heal. You have patients in the hospital, guys, that have uh, may have a, 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 a bed sore as big as your fist. You can stick your whole hand inside of his wound, right? Because they've been laying on it for so long. And so you have those uh, wounds that just won't heal. We can put them in hyperbaric chamber. All right, okay. Let's take another 10 minute break and we're going to talk about the equipment for hyperbaric therapy. The equipment. So we got hyperbaric. I'm going to pause the recording. All right, coming back from break. Quick announcement before we go into the therapy of uh, hyperbaric equipment. We're not sure how the weather is going to be tomorrow. I'm waiting on an ice storm and all that to come in. So uh, they're supposed to let me know at 6 a.m. And I'm not about to be up at 6 a.m. trying to let y'all know this. I know you've already made plans or whatever. So I'm going to make the plans for you right now. So we'll, you'll have time to make that decision. Uh, so tomorrow, you're going to log in at 1 o'clock, like regular class. When we'll log in at 1, I'm going to review from 1 to 3 this section. Go back from the top and just kind of review. Uh, from one to three, maybe work on a couple of little worksheets here and there. And at three o'clock or three fifteen, something like that, everybody's going to cut their camera on, and I'm going to take you're going to take your test virtual. Okay, this one this one will have to be virtual just in case the weather is bad. It might be clear as a bell. Who knows? But that's too cutting it too close to try to make plans when you got kids and all of that. So tomorrow from one to three, don't come to class. Okay. Uh, just come 
online. Just go online at one like your regular class day. We will review from one to three. And at three o'clock, I'm going to open up the exam as long as your camera is on and I can see you. So tonight, today, you need to be working on your vi video uh, situation, okay? It can't be like this where you're taking a test and all I see is your face. It's got to be enough for me to see your space. Make sure you're not pulling uh, because if they if they go back and look at it, they're going to say, well, you didn't proctor it right, right? And that would be on me. So I need to be able to see you in your work. So usually what we do is the student will have on their laptop, take their test on their laptop, right? And then have their cell phone logged into the Zoom as well and just kind of prop your cell phone up on the side. And I can see you through the cell phone while you're taking your test on your computer. All right. So usually we tell them when it's a proctoring situation, you need to have two devices where you can log in. Uh, either if you take the test on your phone, then you have your laptop logged in where I can see your workspace. Now, I'm not looking for perfection, okay? But if I can see, you know, enough to know, like, say you were taking your test right here, that's enough, okay? That's enough for me to be able to see you got the little setup, and I know that you don't have anything there, okay? Uh, with virtual, you see one question at a time, and it is not as long as you would if you were here, okay? Because we have to account for you staying on. You can't be looking off the screen. Uh, they can tell, well, we can tell when some, sometimes students are doing this, right? Taking the test and then, and then back to the test and then back to, I mean, it's obvious, right? I will cut the test off if you do that, all right? So as long as you have it basic where I can kind of seal this is enough. You're taking the test like this, I can see you writing and typing in your answers. You got one answer at a time. Everybody's answer is going to be different. Your number one won't be somebody else's number one. So that kind of will cut back on that part. All right. So get that game together. Because if you don't and say, Miss Carl, I don't have but one device. I can't, uh, no way I can do it. I can see what I got, what you got, and we can make a decision at that time. Uh, but you don't want to have to be making up a test because that means you, you can only get 89%, all right, on a makeup test. Because once I open up that test, I can't let you take it later for 100% credit because uh, it's compromised. So work on that today and tomorrow before class. One o'clock, come in. We're going to review one to three, right? Go over some of the homework or questions you might have. Uh, and then we're gonna knock the test out. Once the test is over, then you're done. Now the lab, we're gonna to have to make up at a later date, okay? Cause some of you live far away. It may be more icy where you live than somebody else and all of that Well, I couldn't come. And so to avoid all of that, we're just gonna make up the oxygen, low flow and high flow systems at a later date. What is gonna happen is I'm gonna add it to another lab. And so that, that day you'll have two labs instead of one. So it won't be an extra day in there. It'll just be have to double up on another lab day, okay? So I just recorded that. That is uh, what we're going to do tomorrow, okay? So Mr. McCarthy, so when we're taking the test and we log into Zoom on our laptop, can we just log in through the modules on the app on Canvas on our phone and just have them both going at the same time? Yes, yeah, that's what I was saying. Okay. Log in on, you log in, you can log in to, to the Zoom and whatever you want to log in on the Zoom. As long as you log into this Zoom, uh, then you will, I'll be able to see you, okay? So whatever you want to take the test what, on. Go ahead. Question? What if we already made arrangements to be at the school at, to be at the school at four? Say it again. What if we already had arrangements to be at the school at four o'clock and we can log in on the test at, at three? Well, this is for the class, though. This is like, you know, this will be like rock you on right now, right? Yeah. You won't be able to log in at 3 o'clock this time tomorrow and take your test? You don't have to come. Just just log in and take the test. It'll probably be a few minutes after 3, like 3.15 or something. Yeah, that's fine. I'm not going to cut you off like that. That's fine. Okay. Yeah, because, you know, it's the weather thing. It's, it's, it's the weather thing. That's what's messed it up. Because if not, I would have to have some of y'all log in at one, take a test, and then the four o'clock group log in and take the test. But then I'm, 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 since we're not coming, we're gonna do it all at one time. Okay, so I don't have to proctor two separate 
online versions of tests. That's different when y'all come in, I can just watch you do it. But when I proctor, I got to watch you closely. And that means I'll have to do that twice. So you coming a little bit later than three o'clock is not that big of a deal. Okay. I'll make sure you have, when you log in, you're going to have the same amount of time everybody else has. Okay. Uh, which will be about 30, 32 minutes, something like that. As soon as you log in, then you got 32 minutes to complete it. All right, so yeah, get to where you can get, where you can get, where I can see you and comfortable and you can go and take the test tomorrow. All right, hyperbaric equipment. Hyperbaric equipment. So we got the monoplace chamber and the multi-place chamber. The monoplace is simply that, one person gets in there. All right. So if only one person gets into the monoplace, then it is pressurized with oxygen. Okay. We're not worried about if that's going to be a problem, right? Uh, because in a multi-place chamber, we pressurize it with room air. Because what if the worker, what if the respiratory therapist is a COPD, right? What if you are a respiratory therapist? And you are in, you know, you're taking care of patients inside of a mono, I mean, a multi-place chamber, and we bring that pressure down. Well, I don't want to affect that person, right? I only want to affect the patients. So when we have a hyperbaric chamber that allows more than one person to get in, then we bring the pressure down by using room air. And that gets it down to three atmospheres, right? And then we give oxygen to just the patients. The patient will have an oxygen hood on or oxygen mask on. And so the oxygen that they're breathing now becomes super saturated once the pressure goes down. But for the worker, he or she is, is cool. It's just he's in, a, he's in a hyperbaric chamber, but he's not being affected by the oxygen because he don't have no oxygen on himself. Okay. So that's why we pressurize the multi-place with um, air and not oxygen. Okay. Now the monoplace, since you're the only one going in, you don't need an oxygen mask. We can pressurize the whole room or the whole unit with pure oxygen. And so now you're the only one getting the effects and I'm sitting out on the outside watching you. Okay. So the monoplace is a small vessel that holds one patient and is pressurized with oxygen. The multi-place chamber is a large vessel, looks like a submarine, and it holds more than one patient. It's pressurized with room air and the patient breathes oxygen via a mask or a hood, okay? These chambers allow the healthcare provider to be in the chamber with the patient without being affected by the high oxygen, okay? So now I can sit right beside you in the same hyperbaric chamber and I don't get the effects of the supersaturation because I'm not on oxygen, you are, right? And the room itself is pressurized with just regular room air. Okay, those are the only two types, monoplace and multiplace. Mono being one, multi being more than one. This is what it looks like. This is the multiplace that I was just talking about. It's like a, it looks like a ship, like a submarine, okay? The windows are back, the hatches are battened down really strong because of the high pressure. The patients, look at them, they're all on oxy hoods. They have an oxygen hood on. The room itself is pressurized with room air. So this guy here, He's not being affected by the high oxygen. He's going around making sure everybody's mask is working right and whatever, you know, checking their vitals and stuff like that. But he's not being affected by the oxygen because the room itself is pressurized with room air. But these people are actually getting some oxygen. See, she got her oxygen tubing. Everybody has an oxygen hood on. So the ones who have oxygen on are now benefiting from the high oxygen content. Okay, on this side is the mono place or single place, right? And now he the only one, she's the only one who can go in there. So this is pressurized with oxygen. So she won't need an oxygen cannula. She don't need a mask, none of that. Because when we put her in there, we're gonna seal it up and bring the pressure down using oxygen. And that way she's the only way being affected. And the other people will stand on the outside and look in, okay? That's the difference between the um, single place and multi-place chamber. 
All right. Now, what about some of the indications? I mean, the contraindications. We learned why we would do uh, these hyperbaric ther therapy, but what are some reasons why we would not do it? There's certain people, certain patients, certain conditions that we need to think twice before we do it. Some hazards that may happen onto certain people. Number one, and this is what you need to highlight, the number one absolute contraindication is an untreated pneumothorax that occurs during therapy. A pneumothorax is a hole in the lung. If somebody has a hole in the lung, we must get them out of there immediately and do not uh, pressurize them any farther because what's going to happen is you're going to cause that lung to collapse. Okay? So the number one absolute contra indication. An uh, indication is something that a reason why we would do it. A contraindication is a reason why you would not do it. Okay? Just like swimming in a pool. What would be the number one contraindication to jumping in the pool? If it's green. <laughs> yeah, that'd be one, but that ain't the absolute. What will be the absolute? You can't swim. You can't swim. Okay? If you cannot swim, don't jump your in the pool. Okay, that's the number one contraindication. So that's that's how important this is. A pneumothorax is the absolute contraindication to hyperbaric therapy. Okay, number two, a patient with a URI. A URI, it may be difficult to clear their ears during therapy. Okay, uh, I forgot what URI stands. Not a, it's not a rest. It's not a, a urinary tract infection. It's a Something that got to do with your ears. I'll look it up. But if they have a URI, URI, it may be difficult to clear their ears during the therapy. You may have to even postpone the therapy until their infection is resolved. Okay? So it's, an, it's a, some type of infection up in the ears. Uh, number three, patients with air trapping. Patients who have air trapping already uh, it says slower decompression rate may assist the patient with eliminating the gas as it expands due to decreased pressure of decomposition. So those gases start to expand. And if you already have trapped gas, right, and then you take you down, it's going to make those bubbles even bigger, right? And then it's going to cause pain, right? It could cause some pain. So pneumothorax, patients with a URI, Patients with air trap, and those are three contraindications. Let's see if there's any more. Number four, some patients may be unable to equalize pressure in their middle ear. So people with middle middle ear issue. And have there, you ever heard of somebody saying, I got tubes in my ears, or my baby had to get tubes in his ears or whatever? Those are uh, little devices that are put into your ears to balance Equal uh, to equilibrize pressure and stuff in the people's middle ear. If your middle ear is off, your balance is off, right? And sometimes they have to have what's called temp tympani, tympani tubes, tympani tubes in their ears, okay? Tubes in the ears. So if you have an equalization pressure problem in the middle ear, we may have to put uh, 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 tubes in your ears bilaterally before the therapy. So they can put tubes in there before your therapy, then after therapy, they can take them out. Okay? Which seemed like it would be painful to me. But you have to see if the benefits outweigh those issues, right? If you're bleeding on the inside or leukemia and stuff like that, you know, tubes in your ears is not a big deal. Okay? Number five, patients with chronic hypercarbia. Who is that? First of all, what is hypercarbia? What is hypercarbia? Uh, keeping too much CO2 in, not releasing it. Yes, see, high CO2, hypercarbia is high CO2. Remember, CO2, AKA capnia, AKA carbia, AKA ventilation, AKA acid, right? So high, somebody who is hypercarbic has a lot of CO2. So people with chronic, that means somebody who's always has a high CO2. So what patient always has a high CO2? 
COPDers. COPDers. Okay. So the person who always has a high CO2 no longer responds to what chemo receptor? Central. Central. See, I'm building up. So the patient with chronic hypercarbia, we know that hypercarbia means a high CO2, okay? Chronic high CO2 would be that COPD patient who's always has a high CO2. And since they no longer respond to the central chemoreceptor, they only respond now to the what? Which chemoreceptor do they respond to? Peripheral. Peripheral, right? And so the peripherals respond to what? Your peripheral chemoreceptors respond to what? The aortic bodies. That's one of them. That's one of them. What, what do they respond Low PaO2. To? There you go. They respond to low PaO2, also known as hypoxemia. Right? So now, now that you've broken all that down, if I put a patient who is a COPD or in hyperbaric chamber, they will then remove their hypoxic drive because I'm about to make his sat be high. I'm about to make his P little AO2 go up to almost 1500. Will he be hypoxic anymore? No. No. And so if he's not hypoxic anymore, that means he's not going to do what? Breathe. Breathe. Excellent. Okay. And if he doesn't breathe or he breathes really slow, he's going to start building even more what? CO2. There you go. See how this works? Okay. That's how you have to be able to deduct and reason for your condition. Excellent job. Okay. So COPD or don't put him in there because if you do, you're going to knock out his hypoxic drive because he doesn't respond to his chemo central chemo receptor no more. He only responds to his peripheral and his peripherals respond to hypoxemia. And if I put him in a hyperbaric chamber, he's no longer going to be hypoxic. <laughs> and if he's not, he's not going to breathe. Okay. That's how you work that out. This is a picture of the tubes in your ears. Just a, a that looks like, to me, like I say, it looks painful. You got to go way up in there and put that tube in there, okay, just for this therapy. But this is just a picture of the tubes in your ears. They put that in there to balance out that pressure because when I put them down in three atmospheres, that's a lot of pressure on the middle ear. All right, last thing, oxygen analyzers. Oxygen analyzers, guys, are simply devices that we can put into the flow of the gas and tell me how much oxygen it is. It may say on this Venturi system that they're actually getting what? This right here says what? How many percent? 28. 28. It may say that, but what if I want to check to make sure? Well, I can use what's called an oxygen analyzer and stick it right here into the flow. And as the gas passes over the little detector in my hand, it's going to tell me, oh, yep, that's 28%. Okay. And I know because if the words are not on here, or if I have a tandem like we did earlier, and I didn't feel like working out this problem, then I can just stick the probe into the flow and it'll tell me how much it is. Okay. It'll tell me. That's an oxygen analyzer. It analyzes the amount of oxygen in the gas that's going. You don't know what kind of gas. It could be carbon monoxide. It could be helium. It could be oxygen. It could be room air. You don't know, right? If, if you don't know, the oxygen analyzer will tell you, all right? Now, they do it in two different ways. They either measure the partial pressure, which will be in millimeters of mercury, or they tell you the actual percentage. Some, some of them will report in partial pressure. Some of them report in percentage. And that's what you got to know. Now, you're about to learn how intricate these analyzers are. And I'm not going to make you, you don't have to remember how intricate they are. Like some of them say you have a diaphragm and when the oxygen goes in, it makes this little mirror move. The mirror reflects off another mirror and that tells you the percent. You don't have to remember all that. Even though that is very, they're a very, very complicated and sophisticated. Uh, and it's good to know, but you won't have to remember all of that. All I need you to know is when I name an oxygen analyzer, you have to tell me whether it measures the partial pressure of oxygen or does it measure the actual percentage of oxygen. 
okay? And then you also have to tell me um, how to calibrate the oxygen analyzer, okay? Calibration is something that has to be done before you can use it to make sure it is in the right ranges, okay? So here we go. Oxygen analyzers. They're used to analyze high flow systems. We don't use them in low flow systems, okay? We, we use oxygen analyzers to analyze the oxygen in a high flow system, whether it's a Venturi, we're not sure if it is a ox, uh, uh, aerosol face tint, aerosol T piece, aerosol trade color, aerosol, uh, what, what else? Face mask, right? All of those things, if they don't say it on the machine, we need to be able to analyze it, okay? If it's a tandem or whatever is going on, we can analyze it, all right? Patients may not receive FIO2 analyzed if the flow is not adequate, okay? If I don't turn the flow up to where it should be, like remember, we said that if I turn the flow up too high, the FIO2 will do what? Go down. If I turn the flow down, the FIO2 will go up. Okay, so if I want them to get a certain FIO2, I got to have it on the right flow, right? That's what we said about this, which is a Venturi, right? So this is a Venturi system that has how much FIO2 is this one? Let me go away. The pink one, you said the pink one is? 40. 40, good. So the pink one is 40, but it's only 40 if I use the right amount of liters. So it's the, eight. there you go. So this is a 40% Venturi, right? But it's only going to get me 40% if I have the right flow. And the flow should be what? Eight. Eight liters per minute. So if I don't have at least eight, it's not going to be 40. If I got, you know, different flow, then the FL2 is going to be different. So that's what they're saying right there. Got to be the right flow. Okay. It's used in measuring the FIO2 during mechanical ventilation as well. So mechanical ventilation is life support, okay? The ventilator. And the ventilator does it itself. You don't have to analyze the oxygen content on a ventilator. That will be automatic. It's in the machine, okay? But if something was to happen, then you could do it, okay? If it's not working for whatever reason, you can uh, analyze it. All right, so here, here to go right here. This is one type here. This is just a picture of an analyzer. You see this little part here? This is where you would put inside the flow, okay? You would stick this little head part right here into the stream of the gas, okay? And then it will tell you what it is. So right now, this is reading how much, what is this considered? What, how much oxygen is this? Where, where, where must it be? It's room air. Room air, 21, good. It's, it, I mean, Brittany, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, room air, okay? 20.9%. Room air, 21%, right? See, it's not in any kind of oxygen flow, so it should be 20.9 or 21%. Now, if you have this open and it's reading 30% right here, then you know that's wrong. We need to calibrate it. And so what we do is we, we hit the calibration button and push the down arrow to bring it down to 21. So it's, it's reminding, no, you're not in 30%, bro. You're in room air. So that's what, is, that's what you would do. You would remind the analyzer where it should be. That's how you set the parameters, okay? You'd put it in room air and make sure it says 21. And then you would put it in the stream of pure oxygen and make sure it says what? 100. 100%. Okay? And so that's how you analyze. But it's going to be so a little bit more tricky how you analyze, but we'll learn that in a minute. So this is one example of an oxygen analyzer, okay? Here go the types. Number one, pragma pragmagnetic or physical analyzers. The paramagnetic, also known as physical analyzer, is the first type, okay? And now you're about to see how intricate they are. They utilize the Pauling principle or the principle of paramagnetism, okay? This is how it works. The analyzer consists of two magnets in a hollow dumbbell field with nitrogen between them. The dumbbell is suspended by a quartz fiber with a mirror attached to it. The oxygen is attracted to the magnetic field 
and its molecules will align themselves with the north and south magnetic poles. The dumbbell is displaced by the oxygen and is made to turn or rotate. The mirror attached indicates the degree of rotation by reflecting light into a special scale. This scale indicates the partial pressure and the percentage of oxygen in the sample gas. Gas must be dry because water vapor will alter the magnetic field. We dry gas with blue silica gel crystals. Remember that. We dry gas. In order to make the gas really dry, we use what's called blue silica gel crystals. And this paramagnetic analyzer, here's the most important part right here, measures the partial pressure of the gas. That's what you need to know. All that I just said, what you need to know is that the paramagnetic analyzer measures the partial pressure of the gas. It measures the partial pressure of the gas. And it also, you need to know that it uses dry gas, right? So in order for the gas to get dry, we use what's called blue silica gel crystals. Now, all of that I just said was amazing to me. When I first read, I was like, damn, all of that's going on inside that little analyzer? Mirrors and rotation and degrees and all of that? That is amazing. Very, very sophisticated. They're very expensive, okay? Uh, but you don't have to remember how the process works. You just need to know that paramagnetic analyzers, the gas must be dry and it measures the partial pressure of the gas, okay? The percent O2 scale must be recalibrated with changes in altitude, okay? The example is the Beckman D2. That's what this is right here, it's old. This is very old. The Beckman D2 paramagnetic analyzer. This is what the old school one looks like. It measures the partial pressure of the gas. The paramagnetic, uh, paramagnetic analyzer, how does it measure? What does it measure? Partial pressure of gas. Partial pressure of the gas. So it's going to give you an answer in millimeters of mercury. Okay. When you see that answer, it's not going to be percent. It's going to be in millimeters of mercury because it measures the partial pressure of oxygen, which is PO2. Okay. And that's going to be written in millimeters of mercury. Okay. Now, blue silica gels, just remember blue and air, right? Air, dry air, sky, blue. Okay. Uh, same thing they put in your shoes when you go get a first pair of Jordans or Jordashes. Do y'all still get, do y'all buy Jordashes? That might be old school. When you get a brand new pair of sneakers, right? They have those little packs inside that say, do not eat. Anybody know what I'm talking about? That little piece of, pla uh, it's a little pack. Yeah, it's like a little white pack with little beads in yeah. it. Yeah, those beads, those are called blue silica gel crystals. What they do is keep the shoes dry. Because in transportation, they could be coming from China or whatever. And the, the moisture from the boat and all that can make your shoes be, you know, uh, humidified and wet. And so to keep the shoes inside the box dry, they use blue silica gel crystals. So these crystals are not a pack. They're already built inside of that analyzer. Okay. That is the paramagnetic analyzer. That's the first one. The second one is electrical analyzers. This is the second type of oxygen analyzer. The electrical analyzers use a principle of thermoconductivity. Sophisticated as well. Look at what it does. A gas of greater mass and density has a better ability to conduct heat. Okay, that's just physically uh, based on physics. It uses a special circuit known as the wheat stump excuse me, the Wheatstone Bridge. So that is an important name there. The electrical analyzer uses a special circuit called the Wheatstone Bridge to detect small changes of resistance. This is how it works. Two chambers with electrical wires passing through each of them. One for reference and one for measuring the change in resistance. Cooling the wire decreases the resistance 
which allows for increased electrical current flow. Oxygen is more dense than nitrogen. Remember that nitrogen makes 78% of the outside air. So due to the increased density of oxygen, when more is in the sampling chamber, the wire is cooled more, and so more current passes through that wire. Here it is. The electrical analyzers measure the actual percent and not the pressure. The electrical analyzers measure the actual percent of the gas and not partial pressure. So it will be written like this in a percent. So the electrical analyzers measure the percent, the electrochemical, I'm, I'm sorry, did, did I say electrochemical? I meant the, um, the paramagnetic use, uh, they measure the actual partial pressure. So the paramagnetic, also known as the physical analyzer, measure partial pressure of the gas and the electrical analyzers measure the percent. See how sophisticated it is? That's just sophisticated too. Wires passing through and resistance and electrical and all of that. That's a lot. That's amazing that all that's going on inside of this little machine. Okay? A real deal nerd invented this. Okay? And nothing wrong with being a nerd, I'm just saying. All right, it cannot be used with flam in a flammable environment. Of course, it's electrical and all of that, so don't use it in a flammable environment. But this is the electrical analyzer. It measures percent and not pressure. All right. Electrical continue. It's accurate only in O2 and nitrogen mixtures, which is most of the gas, right? Most of the gas that you, you know, outside air, most of the air is oxygen and nitrogen. Those are the two biggest components in the air around you right now is oxygen and nitrogen. Nitrogen is 78%. Oxygen, 21%. That don't even leave just a little bit for the argon and the CO2 and trace gases, right? It's, so the main two things are oxygen and nitrogen. So if you got a helium mixture somewhere, it ain't going to work, okay? It's telling you it only works in the O2 and nitrogen mixtures, which is regular outside air. This is another old school analyzer, right? And the example is called the mirror or the OEM. Look at this mirror. This old school. Look how old this is. See, it says percent oxygen. The electrical analyzers measure the percent. So when you, when you put it in the flow, it's going to come up to the percent, right? Notice how the 21 got the little green mark right there letting you know that that's room air. From 21 all the way to 100%. Old school oxygen analyzer. Now, what's special about this one? The gas must be saturated with water vapor, right? Must be saturated with water. So how do we make the gas wet? We make gas wet with pink silica gels. Okay? We make the gas wet with pink silica gel crystals. So, like I said, you think of the air as dry, you know, blue, dry air, right? Pink, you can think of the inside of somebody's lips, right? If you were kissing somebody, their lips are moist, wet, pink, right? So pink silica gel crystals will moisten the gas, right? Because water is a good a good conductor of what? Electricity. Electricity. So they this is an electrical analyzer. So they want you to have a little bit of water vapor in it so that it can generate a better charge. Okay. So it wets up the gas with pink silica gel crystals, right? Blue one's dry, pink one's wet, okay? The OEM is a newer model of the electrical, which is a little more sophisticated. You know, it's, it's newer. This one's old, but it works just the same. All right, just a couple more and we're done. Electrochemical analyzer. This is the third type. <clears throat> now, the electrochemical analyzer has two two subcategories, galvanic and polographic. Galvanic and polographic are two types of electrical, electrical, electrochemical analyzers, okay? The electrochemical analyzer, I hate this mask, has two, 
has two types, the galvanic and the polographic. Both of these are electrochemical O2 analyzers. Okay, now let's go back. The first type was the paramagnetic. The paramagnetic analyzer measures the partial pressure. Has to be dry, right? Then the second one was the electrical analyzers, which uses a special circuit called the Wheatstone Bridge. You, I promise you'll see that word, Wheatstone Bridge. That's the electrical analyzer, right? And it uses, it measures percent and not partial pressure. It measures the actual percent, okay? The gas inside of the electrical must be moist. So they use the pink silica gel crystal. Right? The third type is what we're talking about now is the electrochemical analyzer. The electrochemical analyzer has two types, galvanic and polographic, which they pretty much do the same thing, but I'm gonna explain it to you. The galvanic analyzer is composed of two electrodes immersed in potassium hydroxide contained within a capsule with an opening covered by a polypropylene membrane that is permeable to oxygen. See how sophisticated this is? At the lead, I mean, at the lead anode or lead anode, the hydroxide compound is oxidized in the presence of oxygen. This releases electrons developing a current. At the gold cathode, Oxygen is reduced to form OH ions, thus consuming those electrons. The current is measured from anode to cathode. The greater the partial pressure of the oxygen, the greater the measured content. The measured current is used to indicate the percent of oxygen. The analyzer measures, here it is, this analyzer measures the partial pressure of oxygen. The analyzer, which is the electrochemical, right? Which has two types, galvanic and polographic. Right now we're talking about the galvanic, which they pretty much do the same thing. The only difference is the cathodes and the anodes and stuff, okay? They measure the partial pressure of the oxygen and must be calibrated at different altitudes because of barometric pressure, okay? So if I have one here in Memphis, I calibrate it, but I need to calibrate it a different way if I'm in Denver because the partial pressure of the atmosphere is different at high altitudes, right? Okay, this is the most important part right here. The analyzer measures the what? Partial pressure of the oxygen. That is the electrochemical which we're talking about the galvanic type at this moment. Let's look at the next one. Same one, we're still talking about electrochemical. Remember we said electrochemical has two types, galvanic. Now we're talking about the polographic. Polographic is known as the Clark electrode, the Clark electrode. For some reason, when I was in school, I thought about Clark Kent Superman, but somehow I tied it with the Clark electrode, okay? Uh, I was talking about air or whatever. I don't know, but that's how I remembered it. So the polographic card, this is how it works. It's also composed of two electrons immersed in potassium chloride contained within a capsule with an opening covered by a polypropylene membrane that is permeable to oxygen. Now this one has a silver anode. So at the silver anode, the potassium is oxidized in the presence of oxygen. This releases electrons developing a current. At the platinum cathode, oxygen is reduced to form OH ions, thus consuming those electrons. The current is measured from anode to cathode. So we got silver and platinum on this one, okay? The greater the partial pressure of the oxygen, the greater the, me the measure of current, and the measured current is used to indicate the percentage of oxygen. Number seven, once again, this analyzer measures the partial pressure of oxygen.
So the electrochemical, whether it be galvanic or polarographic, they both measure the partial pressure of oxygen. So it's going to be written in millimeters of mercury. Number eight, must be calibrated at varying altitudes, just like the other one, and has a battery to in, uh, improve the response time. So it says a whole lot of stuff just to say it measures partial pressure. All right. And last but not least, the chemical analyzer. Chemical, just straight up chemical by itself, which is used in major labs, probably where, um, uh, you know, like vaccines are made. You'll never see this in the hospital. These are very, very expensive. The chemical analyzer utilizes direct subtraction of gases. Mixed gas sample is emitted into the sample chamber. Each gas in the mixture is removed and weight change is equal to the percent of gas in that mixture. And it is used in laboratories. So the chemical analyzer measures the percent. The percent. All it does is it, you just put in all the gases and it will weigh each gas. Each gas then is removed. Like it'll remove the nitrogen, it'll remove the oxygen, it'll remove everything. And that changes the weight. And that weight change is equal to the percent of each gas in that mixture. Okay? That is used in laboratories. So that's just four. Sound like a lot, but it's only four. There are four types of oxygen analyzers. So let's go back. Number one. What's number one? Everybody say it. Paramagnetic. Physical. Yeah, paramagnetic or physical analyzer. The paramagnetic analyzers measure what? Partial pressure of gas. Partial pressure and the gas must be dry. Okay. Number, number two, electrical analyzers. The electrical analyzers measure what? Percentage. Percentage. They measure the percentage, right? And the gas must be moist. Number three, electrochemical analyzers, which are two types, galvanic and polarographic. Both of them measure what? Partial pressure. Partial pressure of oxygen. And then finally, uh, number four is the chemical analyzers. And the chemical analyzers measure what? Percentage. Percentage, percentage of gas mixture. There you go. Those are the four oxygen analyzers. Like I said, you won't have to, you will not have to tell me how each one works. You will tell me the basics. Like, does it have to be dry? Does the gas need to be moist, dry, what, you know? You won't have to tell me about silver and platinum cathodes and sodium hydroxide. You don't have to do none of that. Okay, that's over, overshot. I don't know why they even added all of that. Okay, but you don't. You just need to know what they measure and what they are. Okay. All right. The last part of this whole oxygen therapy is how do we calibrate these analyzers? Now this is where it can get tricky if you don't pay attention. Calibration. Calibration, guys, is when I want to make sure that this analyzer is in the right range, right? Uh, if you say that it, this is 100% and I put it on there and it's only showing 80, it's probably out of calibration, right? I need to calibrate it first and then test the gas to make sure it's accurate, okay? So there are some steps at which we need to know how and when to calibrate the, cal the, uh, the analyzer. And then we'll be done for the day. Now, the first thing, the analyzer should be calibrated to air and then 100% when you first pull it out the bag for the day. When I first take it out, I need to calibrate it to room air and then I calibrate it to oxygen, okay? I stick it up in room air, make sure it says 21. Then I stick it right into the flow of 100% oxygen and it better say 100%. If it says 93, I hit the up button till it gets to 100, and I'm done. Okay? Now, if you look at this picture right here, this analyzer is hooked up to this cylinder right here. 
and it's telling how much oxygen is in this cylinder, it says room air. What is this gas coming out of here? Air. No. It's black. What color is a black cylinder? Nitrogen. Nitrogen. So it's saying it's, it's saying it's room air coming out of there, but it's nothing but nitrogen. It's really just nitrogen. Okay? It's nitrogen. But they're just showing you what it looks like. Okay. This analyzer right here, it doesn't have anything hooked up to it. So it's better show 21%, right? Room air. Okay. Room air. Now, when I first pull out a oxygen analyzer out the box, the first thing I got to do is calibrate it to room air and then calibrate it to oxygen, which is 100%. Now, it changes if I suspect a percentage, okay? Now, if I am following you and you, we're both taking care of Mr. Johnson and you tell me that, uh, yeah, Mr. Johnson is on aerosol face mask. He's doing good. He's breathing fine. His oxygen's being good. He's on 30% aerosol face mask, right? If I want to double check behind you, then I need to do number two, right? If I'm measuring a value that I think or you tell me is less than 60%, then I need to calibrate to 21% last instead of first, okay? So if you tell me he's on 30%, then I'm going to take that analyzer and put it in 100% and calibrate it and then put it in 21% and calibrate it. And then I can measure his gas, okay? So let's look at it because that can get tricky. That can get tricky. But once you got it, you got it. All right, so how do I calibrate? Let's see. All right, so if I'm calibrating. Calibrating an O2 analyzer. Okay, you got 21% gas over here and 100% gas over here. All right. We already said that if, as soon as I take it out of the box for the day, for the shift, right? I'm on shift now and I'm about to get my stuff together and go do my, my work, right? Well, when I first open it up, I'm gonna take that analog and I'm going to stick it, I'm gonna, that's, that's, I'm just showing some flow, right? This is flow. And then this is flow, okay? If I have an analyzer in my hand, let's say this calculator is my analog. When I first open it up, I'm gonna to analyze to uh, I'm going to do uh, 21% and make sure it says 21. Then I'm going to take it out and put it under the 100% and make sure it says 100%. All right. Now, if I suspect a gas, right, you told me that Mr. Smith is on 30% FIO2. Well, the rule says any gas that I suspect is less than 60%, then I measure, I calibrate to 21% last, okay? So if you tell me Mr. Smith is on 30%, then I'm gonna take this uh, analyzer, calibrate it to 100, and then calibrate to 21%, and then I can measure him, see? 21% last, 100% first, 21% last, okay? Because it's less than 60, okay? So the rule is, if it is, if I suspect the gas is, let's see, gas less than 60%, then 21% last. If the gas is greater than 60%, then 
that I do 100% last. So if you tell me Mr. Smith is on 30%, then that's less than 60. I'm gonna go here, then I'm gonna go here. If you tell me Mr. Smith is on 80%, that's greater than 60, I'm gonna go here, and then I'm gonna go here. Got it? What if he had, if I say he's on 75%, where do I go last? 100. 100, if he's greater than 60, I do 100% last. So what I do is, a, you say, Mr. Smith, he on 70%. And I say, 70? You lying. Let me go check, right? Well, if, it's, if I think it's greater than 60, then I'm going to do 100% last. So I'm going to go open it up, put it on the 21%, make sure it says 21, and then I'm going to go to 100% and make sure it says 100. Then I can go to him and calibrate and, and analyze him, okay? This is the calibration step. This is analyzing. When I'm analyzing, when I'm reading what they're on, the calibration is when I'm calibrating, making sure it's in the right ranges, okay? What about if I say he's on, he's on 40%. Mr. Smith on 40% FL2. Where do I go last? 21%. 21%. So I will take it out, do 100, and then do 21. Okay? If the gas is less than 60, I calibrate to 21% last. If it's greater than 60, I calibrate to 100% last. Okay? So if I say it is uh, 73%, I say he on 73%, where do I go last? Huh? 100%. 100%. If it's greater than 60, I do 100% last. So if I tell you he on, if you tell me he on 70%, then where should I calibrate last? 100%, because that's greater than 60, right? So greater than 60, I will calibrate to 100% last. So if it's 72%, I'm going to come here, and then I'm going to come here. Then I go to him and analyze. See, this is not analyzing. This is calibrating, right? And then him is analyzing, all right? So what if I say he is on 55%? Mr. Johnson is on 55%. Where do I go last? 21 21%. It's less than 60, so I do 21% last. So I will come here, then I come here, and then I analyze him. Okay? So that's why I drew this, because it can get a little tricky trying to remember what you do last. So that's, go back and watch the video, less than 60, 21% last. Greater than 60, 100% last. That's how you calibrate. Okay? That's how you, because you got to get it in the right ranges. That way, when I do go to Mr. Johnson, it's going to give me an accurate reading. Whatever it says, that's what he on. Okay? All right. All right, let's finish up. All right. All right, now, so if measuring the value less than 60, do 21% last. If measuring the value greater than 60, calibrate to 100% last. You must calibrate once per shift, okay? You're supposed to calibrate your oxygen analyzer once a shift. Now, this is another one of those multiple, multiple, Sydney. This is a multiple, multiple test question. It's going to say all of these are sources of error in an analyzer, right? It might say accept or it might say which one of these, but it's a multiple multiple. This is it right here. Weak batteries is one thing. A torn, wet, or leaky membranes is another source. Somebody that is on positive pressure or PEEP, right? That's another source of error. And then altitude, that will be another source of error. Okay, four possible reasons why your analyzer would be would give you an error reading. Whether the batteries are bad, you might have a torn, wet, or leaky membrane. 
if they're on positive pressure, if I'm forcing air in, that may throw your analyzer off. Or if they're at Denver, right, or in the Swiss Alps somewhere, it's going to be a different altitude. That will give me sources of error, okay? Those are the four things that will cause my analyzer to say error. You know how it says ERR? And you're like, well, what's wrong? Well, check the batteries. It may be a torn wet or leaky membrane. It may be that they're on positive pressure or in a higher altitude, okay? That is the lesson, okay? That is the lesson. Now, I will scroll through this lesson plan really quick. So until you wanna go over to see if you missed anything on far as the note-taking guide is concerned, it's fine, all right? Starting back with uh, from the beginning, okay? And I'm not going to talk about them. I'm just going to go through so you'll have it and you can look at it. All at right? the yeah. bottom of the note-taking guide, there is non-invasive SpO2 monitoring also. Okay. Let me look at it. All right. So oxygen therapy, here it is right here. Those are the indications. You can pause it when you get home. And, I mean, you know, later and look at it. I think we covered everything. Everything pretty much comes straight from this to the PowerPoint. But just in case, here it is. Hazards. It's really blurry. It's blurry. I, I don't. Sometimes it does that. I don't know why it does that. Is that better? Not really. Uh, the PowerPoint on the actual uh, module this clears, and it's basically the same thing. Yeah. It's yeah. No, I was. I was just saying it was blurry. Okay, well, I'm going to go through them. That's the hazards, guidelines, low flow systems, low flow devices, high flow systems. There's all the devices. Hyperbaric chamber. Oxygen analyzers. Calibration. Now, <clears throat> non-invasive and SpO2 monitoring, this is just like talking about the um, uh, pulse ox, pulse ox machine. How do, I, how do I monitor this saturation of oxygen, right? Uh, the saturation of oxygen or the uh, saturation of the PO2, right? So pulse oximeter, we know that a pulse ox, that's what all of you guys got. On day one, when you got your equipment, you should have gotten a pulse ox, right? That little finger thing you put on your finger. And what it does is it measures, <clears throat> let me make it bigger for myself. It measures the saturation of the hemoglobin in arterial blood. But look, it's not always oxygen. The pulse ox on your finger is just saying that the hemoglobin is saturated with something, right? That doesn't necessarily mean it's oxygen. It's supposed to be oxygen. But what if you came out of a house fire? If you come out of a house fire, the pulse ox may say you are 100% saturated with what? Carbon, carbon monoxide. monoxide. But of course, the, the, uh, the pulse ox is not going to say carbon monoxide. It's just going to say 100%. That's why you have to know your patient and you treat the patient, not just the numbers. Because if you look up and say, well, hell, you're 100%. And he's sitting there dying because you didn't know or you don't smell the smoke on him, right? You you'll know when they come out of house fire. But if you're just being, well, he's 100%, I'm moving on, uh, you may be uh, fooling yourself, right? He may be 100% saturated with carbon monoxide, okay? 
So the pulse ox seminars all doesn't always uh, show octave, but 90% of the time it is because not many people you get come out of a house fire, okay? Uh, it uses a, a red and infrared light to detect the changes of color in the blood by bonding of the hemoglobin. As the blood changes color, the redder it is, the more saturated with oxygen it is. Remember we said that? Systemic side is red because it's fully saturated. The darker it is, the less saturated it is, okay? We can put the pulse ox on the fingers, the toes, or earlobes, okay? You can put them on their finger, all 10 digits, hands and toe, I mean 20 digits, hands and feet, right? Or you can put it on their earlobes. Some people uh, have some that go on their forehead, all right? You can read the oxygen in the forehead. Uh, the factors that affect accuracy, of course, when they move it, Mr. Johnson won't be still and he's scratching his, his uh, leg and all that. It makes the, it, you know, it'll make the thing be inaccurate, all right? If the sensor is messed up. What if they have, like you said, dysfunctional hemoglobin, which is carboxyhemoglobin? Low perfusion. What if he has a really low blood pressure? You can't, can't get it, right? His hands might be cold. If you're feeling Mr. Johnson's hands and they ice cold, you're probably not going to get a good reading, okay? You have to try to warm his hands up or put them on his toes or do something uh, because it's not going to get a good reading. Uh, ambient light nail polish. If you got on gel overlays, I can't read your, your sack, right? You got them $500 nails on and you get into a car wreck, we can't read your oxygen sack. We're gonna have to poke you to get it, okay? Uh, so that's the pulse socks. Another way to non-invasive, non-invasive mean not sticking you. Invasive mean it hurt, okay? There are some non-invasive ways for us to test your oxygen. And that is these couple of things here, pulse ox and transcutaneous monitoring. Transcutaneous means under the skin. It provides continuous monitoring of your sac or your saturation of O2. The oxygen molecules diffuse through your skin and through the membrane of the sensor. The sensor will heat your skin to 42 degrees Celsius to facilitate diffusion. The warmer your skin is, the better it diffuses. So you'll have a little patch, it's a patch, right? They put a patch on your arm, okay? And that, that patch will heat your skin up to 42 degrees, right there, Celsius. Uh, and then that, it starts to see the oxygen going in and out of your skin. That's how it monitors your oxygen saturation. Uh, it says, place it flat surface of the chest and the abdomen. That's usually where they use it, on the chest of the abdomen and mostly in infants because their hands and fingers are so little, right? It's, it's hard to put a little probe on an infant's finger. So we put a little transcutaneous patch on the baby, okay? Uh, and it's used to assess the blood flow changes in the uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, okay? So if somebody is in hyperbaric therapy, we can put that transcutaneous monitor on there to check their oxygen levels uh, with that. <clears throat> That's the transcutaneous monitor. All right. Now, that's just the lab. So that's only two. Plus the non-invasive uh, oxygen monitoring, either monitoring through the pulse ox that you have or using the actual um, transcutaneous monitor, which is a skin patch on your chest or your stomach to measure your oxygen. Okay. So make sure you read up on these two to, to understand how they work. Okay, which is, is pretty cut and dry. It's, it's pretty cut and dry how they work. But thanks for telling me that because I sure forgot that that was on the end down there. Uh, and then this is the lab, of course. You don't, we're not going to have the lab, but this is how we would set it up the cannula, set up the simple mass, set up the non rebreather, uh, go through different um, situations. You know, just don't worry about that part. Uh, but we will have the lab at a later date. I will, it will be to be announced. I don't know what day I'm gonna add it to the lab, but tomorrow, start class at one o'clock. We're gonna review for the first few hours. And then at the end, I'm gonna give you the test. So that gives you pretty much an extra day of knowledge. I'm gonna go back to the beginning, ask some questions, work on, uh, go over the homework, maybe go over a few of those workbook questions and at the end, we're going to go ahead and, okay, 
log in, take the exam, and you go home. All right? Everybody be safe because I don't know what this weather is going to be. It might not do nothing at all. Okay? But to be on the safe side and help you with your planning, I'm going to go ahead and tell you now, do not come to the campus tomorrow. Okay? Do not come to the campus tomorrow. Log in at 1. We will review. Any questions that you have, we can go over it. Okay? And maybe even play cahoots or something like that for the first hour or so. And then take our exam and be done. Okay? All right. Have a good day. Homework is in the module for tonight, which is workbook. In your workbook, chapter 42, you're going to do numbers 43 through 72. Do those tonight. They do by midnight. We can go over those when we come to class tomorrow before we take the test. All right? Have a good day. Be safe.